Have you ever heard this song? I'm going to go back there someday. It's sung by Gonzo in the Muppet movie. It has this lovely chord progression where instead of using the minor two, it switches to a major straight away. So even though we're in the key of G, where the second minor is A minor, we have this definitive lift into A major almost straight away. That's called G Lydian, but who cares? My name is Neely, not Adam. Wait a second, hold up, hold up. You can't do that, you can't do that. Uh, that's copyrighted. Not only does that instantly create more color, it also creates more tension. Within that chord change is G to C sharp, the tritone, the devil's interval, that's kind of not a thing. It's a separation of six semitones and the furthest two notes can be apart from one another. It's the go-to discord of dissonance for people like Frank Zappa and Les Claypool. But I'm going to go back there someday has no tall, strange man with a mustache trying to upset your musical sensibilities. It has a gonzo. A uh, whatever. And so we have this really rather sweet melody over top of this literal most tense musical interval. This looks familiar, vaguely familiar. And I love that vaguely familiar cascading on the verge of dissonance over chords that want to pull together to be their own strange kind of pretty. I relate to that. And while we're talking about lyrics, come on, they don't get any more beautiful. Sunrises, nightfalls, sometimes the sky calls. Is that a song there and do I belong there? I've never been there, but I know the way. I'm going to go back there someday. Okay, so it's a little hippy drippy, but think about what that place is that we're going back to, that we've never been before. Think about what Gonzo is trying to describe. There's not a word yet for old friends who've just met. Part heaven, part space, or have I found my place? You can just visit, but I plan to stay. I'm going to go back there someday. Jesus, <laughs> it's so good. I love Gonzo so much. And I guess the writers of the song, Kenny Lee Asher and Paul Williams, but mostly Gonzo. And the song does not exist outside of its context. It's in a musical movie. It has a place within the plot and it has a setting. It's elevated by this dreamlike scene in the desert. It's elevated by its lush arrangement. It's elevated by Gonzo's voice. Goofy, faltering, but incredibly sincere. We're flying, not walking, on featherless wings. As David Byrne said, the better the singer's voice, the harder it is to believe what they're saying. So I use my thoughts to an advantage. And I am not free of context either when interpreting and breaking down the song. I am a Muppet. I am a human Muppet. So don't forget to like and subscribe. I had two Muppet movies on VHS, Christmas Carol and Treasure Island, in my bedroom, each of which I watched at least once a month from the age of about 10 to the age of about 16 or older. And I can relate to Gonzo's words beyond that. I'm one of those people who no longer has a childhood home. My parents rented, the house I grew up in is gone, and my mother passed away when I was in my early 20s. You know the memory of a happy place that you can never go back to. Home is only a memory. Because I've also had a bit of a chaotic life, frankly. I married my first girlfriend when she got pregnant, and of course after a few years we got divorced, so that home became this dream of what once was, too. The familiar transformed into the strange. And do I belong there? Suddenly I'm intruding on what that home has become, and my pictures are taken off the walls, and I have to rewire my brain to not drive there at night by habit. You don't live there anymore, <laughs> turn around. <clears throat> and I have to tear my kids out of there every weekend and try not to take it personally when they occasionally get upset, distressed about that. But I want to go back there someday. This song slaps me in my heart. I have lost home after home to bad judgment and bad luck and love not being enough and love not being right, but also, also, I have been on such adventures, stupid adventures and unlikely adventures and wow, count your lucky stars adventures. And I've found family, I've found love, I've found community, a ragtag bunch of weirdos with bizarre backstories and strange superpowers. My own Muppets, I'm queer. That was all queer allegory stuff. But the longing for adventure goes on, for the kind of adventure that feels like home, feels like me. That's part of what I love about this song so much, it's romanticism. 
you think about what he's saying, this isn't the comfortable but boring Shire versus the exciting but entirely deadly rest of the world. This is adventure as home, home as adventure. You can just visit, but I plan to stay. How many of you have found yourselves truly existentially freaked out by how and how fast you transitioned from child to adult? How it feels as if it didn't work. It worked for other people. It didn't work for you. I transitioned from child to parent in less than a year. I never outgrew the Muppets and I never needed to, and I'm glad I didn't. The Muppets were there for me, children in a world of adults. Kermit was a role model in a world where I was never going to be man enough for any other role model. It's rarer that I feel like Gonzo, but I think I'm drawn to people like Gonzo. I think recklessly brave and experience-driven weirdos are good for me. And there's an aspect of this song that humbles me when I consider, really consider, how deeply other people can feel and how beautiful their experience of the world is. That I could relate to the guy who likes to be fired out of cannons is good for me. Come and go with me, it's more fun to share. And I really do relate. You see, like Gonzo, when I pray to the heavens for opportunity or when I dream of what might be or when I celebrate that dream within myself, I don't want it to be plaintive or self-pitying or bitter. I don't even really want it to be rousing or boisterous or straightforwardly anything. No, I want it nuanced and gentle and outside of myself and curious and most important of all, honest. I think the sort of go-to-the-place, artful, beautiful insight, the sort of stuff you should bother to write songs about, should be honest, generous, shared, mutually intelligible, but big enough that a lot of people find honesty within it, even if it is a lie. It should be like this chord change. Strangely familiar. So this is not a video essay. This same exact video essay just came out like a week ago, so I'm having to do a hard pivot. <laughs> Thanks to something else. We're working on this project, This Is Not A Video Essay, where we want to look at the edges of um, the structure of video essay and where it kind of stops being video essay. Do you only consider it art if it's useless? Do you stop considering it art when it's a video essay? Um, that's that's interesting, and actually, I, I hadn't thought until literally as you were just talking then about some of the ways in which sometimes I've thought of like what is the limits of what we describe as a video essay. It's become the it's become the word that we use for quite a, a massive range of different stuff because the the phrase sort of video essay in um, academic circles is used very differently um, and is often used in a way whereby you are you know, primarily using sort of visuals, um, sort of very much using video uh, to express whatever the thing is that you're trying to express. And sometimes that is about uh, a film and video itself. Maybe it's a sort of piece of film criticism or something, or maybe it is coming from a more personal place of trying to express something more uh, subjective and personal that one sort of feels about the world. But I want to know if you consider what you do art. Um. If I consider what I do art. Okay. Um Well, how are we defining art? Like what is your operational definition of art in this video? I'm not giving you one on purpose. Fuck you, but that's fair. First of all, we got to we got to look at like how do we define art, you know, in comparison in comparison to what? I don't even know. I don't know. I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what That's my okay. I don't it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I realistically, I wish I could tell you. Like, I could go on and on for like what I define art and what art reverberates to me, but I can't. I couldn't tell you what art is, you know, yeah. because there's, 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 because you're too honest. <laughs> That's why. We don't know if this is a video essay. However, we are going to talk about stuff because stuff is really interesting. Here's the stuff. You can make a whole video essay out of this stuff. We didn't, but they did. Look, there they are. They're watching the premiere. 
let's see, what did they talk about? Uh, Pluto, you can make a whole video essay out of that. In fact, Dr. Futuma just did. Our video essays art, you can make a whole video essay out of that. Mia Cole just did. What bizarre coincidences. This whole story is full of coincidences and lies and secrets. When Orson Welles said in the intro to F for Fake, almost any story is almost certainly some kind of lie, but not this time. He was kind of getting at what we're getting at. A coincidence can be a truth that we choose to interpret with a certain amount of dishonesty. Pieces of art are lies, illusions, that we imbue with truth. And lies can be frames. Sometimes you need the lie for the thing to exist, like a magic trick. You can't participate in a magic trick unless you sign off on a little bit of play pretend. F for Fake is considered an example of the film essay genre, a piece of art that straddles the worlds of fiction and non-fiction, taking inspiration from documentary, art house, traditional storytelling, a fourth wall breaking voice of God narrator where the narrator God is unreliable. The film essay or essay film approaches cinema with all of the open-ended possibility of a camera and some cuts and some people saying things. And the film essay can also be considered an ancestor of the video essay. An ancestor like Hallucigenia or Anomala Caris, a weird guy who has nothing to do with anything. In this film essay, Wells tells the story of Elmire de Roy, one of history's most successful art forgers who sold fake paintings to museums, galleries, and collectors all over the world. He sold lies. See? Yeah. Yeah. But in telling the story, Wells recruits an unreliable cast of characters, including himself, the most unreliable of all, and his then-girlfriend, the actress and writer Oya Kodar, who he embeds in the story in ways you can't trust, and the writer Clifford Irving, who was a biographer, and he had written the definitive account of the life and misdeeds of this great forger, Elmire de Ori, but who was himself also a fucking liar. Irving had written an unauthorized and in part made-up biography of Howard Hughes. And Howard Hughes, stay with me, is the person that Orson Welles created a fictional account of in his film Citizen Kane. You might have heard of it. You've heard of it? You've heard of Citizen Kane? Circles of mistruth within circles of mistruth, all about mistruth. Welles, in fact, goes to great lengths to show us that he is an actor, a magician, and a liar. The film is a dizzying magic trick in which we are promised that during the next hour, everything you'll hear from us is really true and based on solid fact. Some of the things contradict the other things and the film is longer than an hour. He's such an asshole. He's like Huckleberry. He's the, he's the Huckleberry of Hollywood. I love him. Wells was a proud liar having secured his first acting gigs here in Ireland simply by lying about his experience on stage in the US. I mean, there's no oversight here in Ireland. No one bothers to look anything up. It's just, oh wow, an actor, brilliant. Jesus, look at the eyebrows on him, he must be good. The last act of F for Fake tells the story of how the Pablo Picasso became enamored with the one and the same Oya Kodar, who, as I said, was dating Orson Welles, who is in the film and whose grandfather was an art forger who forged a bunch of Picasso. What, what strange coincidences, but you know what? There is another layer of unreliable here, and that's me. Hi. So you should probably just watch the film. Orson Welles is a fascinating guy. From his huckster beginning, striding into the Gate Theatre in Dublin and just declaring he was a famous Broadway actor, to putting on an all-African-American production of Macbeth in the 1930s, to the infamous War of the Worlds broadcast, which, owing to a number of random coincidences, and I guess Wells' performance and the tensions leading up to World War II, people really thought was an announcement of an alien attack. This is also the guy that made Citizen Kane, as well as being a visionary masterpiece that was just so beautifully made that its influence will forever be felt on cinema. It was also a fuck you to rich bastards like Howard Hughes and William Randolph Hearst, and they did not like it. And he wound down his career sitting on the jury at Cannes and appearing on late night talk shows to call people stupid and ugly to their faces. He was almost certainly an insufferable curmudgeon and a womanizer and a weirdo and a liar, but well, Orson Welles. I think what makes Welles so interesting to me is that he refused to give the form more importance than the crack. That's the Irish crack, not the drugs kind. It means the fun, the hell of it, the je ne sais quoi, the abandon, the mischievous force of life and the experiential. All the Irish people watching right now are like, stop that. You're ruining it for everyone. It can't be captured. Stop trying. I believe Wells was having the crack a lot of the time and that he had a convoluted and dark sense of humor, that the beauty was contained within the humor. And yes, of course, there was an instinct towards the beautiful. There was a... Like a, a bigness 
a need to make great art, but I also think that a lot of the qualities of his that produced such visionary and uncompromising and sometimes therefore kind of unsatisfying work actually was that he was easily bored and he wanted to have the crack with art. My like very strict but completely vague definition of what art is, is it's something that you make because you have some need to. That desire to show somebody something only you can see. I think that's really interesting because yeah, like you say, it doesn't have to, um, you don't have to succeed. You can, you can sort of end up with a kind of feeling of like, yeah, it's out of me. It's fine. You know, <laughs> and it still was an artistic process, right? Yeah. Diggy! One day you're going to grow up to be a big diggy dog. I don't know what Orson Welles himself would make of this, but there's no real reliable account of the inner workings of the mind of Orson Welles with the persona stripped away. There's only this memifiable idea of the Orson Welles that Orson Welles played. That I think he would like, because as much as he was a gifted filmmaker, I think he knew well that some things cannot be captured by art or by explanation. They can only be hinted at. Of course, he's dead now. Everybody dies. Bim. So the third act of the Muppet movie sees them finally get to the big studio and into the office and face this last all or nothing test. They meet this guy, Lou Lord, played by Orson Welles, and the exchange goes like this. My name is Kermit the Frog and we've read your ad and, well, we've come to be rich and famous. And here's the part where they pull the rug out from under you. Wells says, Miss Tracy. Prepare the standard rich and famous contract for Kermit the Frog and company. The tension is there in those eyebrows, in that swagger and the signaling with that cigar. You can't predict this reaction. Wells is having a laugh at your expense just by being so imposing. Another magic trick, I guess. And look what they're using that trick to do. Subverting your expectations by giving you what you want. The Muppet's dream comes true. Not that being famous or being rich are good things, but a character you love, having their wish come true, is good. And misdirection that aims to show you, oh, actually, sometimes everything's just gorgeous. I think that's pretty good too. The film ends with a fucking unironic rainbow shining down on more furry friends than you've ever seen in your life, singing about lovers and dreamers and you and me. I've sat with two friends who were both on LSD watching this movie and when that ending happened, they just cried and cried and laughed and could not express how fucking beautiful it was, just breathlessly pointing at the screen with tears running down their faces. And this film is 44 years old and we are still hungry for Muppet stuff. That's love. The Muppet movie is a series of self-contained moments that function and are loosely strung together. Sort of a series of skits in a way, an evolution of The Muppet Show in the same way that Monty Python's Holy Grail and Life of Brian were an evolution of The Flying Circus. In all of the above, there is a loose story with a few therefores and howevers, but the overall plot takes second place to having the crack in any given self-contained scene. There is also a framing device in the Muppet movie in that they are watching the Muppet movie. This is similar to the opening of the Simpsons movie and the first SpongeBob SquarePants movie, and it's something of a misstep in my opinion. A TV show making the transition to film doesn't actually owe you an explanation. People aren't like, what? Why is this so long? Why are the stakes so high? And as time passes, the legacy of the film will have as much, if not more, cultural impact than the TV show, and it just becomes weird. But it is very hard to criticize this film I love, not just because I love it, but because I understand that you need a framing device, even if then, like scaffolding, you put all of that load bearing that framing device is doing onto the thing but you still have to start with something to unmake. Or like this great exchange between the Electric Mayhem and Dave Grohl. So you guys remember how we did it in rehearsal? Oh, we like to do it different from rehearsal. Okay, well then why did we even rehearse? Oh, because if we don't rehearse, then there's nothing to do it different from. Who wants to put fruit on their turkey sandwich? You know what, actually, I dig that. So here's something you have a frame of reference for, the Muppets. Now, with that reference frame established, we can talk about storytelling and love and meaning and all that good stuff. We can continue to talk about Orson Welles. We can interrogate the unreliable narrator to get to the truth beyond. But it's a trick. It's a lie. 
but it would appear that it is a necessary lie because we can't just transpose knowledge or an opinion from one person to another. We have to pretend because we also can't just be intimate, like be close. We can't just bleed out with the full emotional impact of what do they make video essays about? Just Big Joel screaming and chewing on a pillow and wailing and crying to the night. Dr. Phil, ah, bring it to you, my pain. The Iron Giant is so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Harry Potter, it's very badly written. So we have to work up to it by way of misdirection. I, I wonder if that's fair, actually, to equate having a frame that obscures your intention with lying. I think I often think in terms of like what the wrapping is for a certain right. topic. So usually there's something that is a bit, not necessarily esoteric, but kind of that I, that I want to talk about, that I, that I want to spend time reading about, that I want to spend time writing about, that I want to then um, <laughs> express to a, an audience in some way that maybe I don't initially know what the buy-in for them would be. Like, here's a way that it can be really relevant to people because I, cause I don't necessarily... And, and sometimes my thinking is the opposite way around. Sometimes there is a, like, contemporary thing that I want to talk about and then I go away and find the particular theoretical or kind of historical framework or whatever it is um, that I want to use to then talk about that. <laughs> the way I try and sort of frame it at least is actually it's about kind of finding a way of going how is this relevant to people's lives. What are some of the things specifically that because you're thinking of your audience and because you're thinking of a predominantly white audience, what are some of the things that you can't do or can't say? When, when I talk about white supremacy specifically, it's a very jarring experience because I have to limit how I talk about it because it right. conflate, conflate with the people that I'm talking about. And then they're viewed in that way and they're hate, and then a hate mob goes toward them or something. Mm -hmm. And I don't want people scared uh, when they interact with me in the commentary tube of like, oh, I released this video with a specific microaggression. Is Terb gonna dunk on me? But I'm somebody who really fucking hates being constrained. Like I hate it with a fiery passion of a thousand white hot suns. I, ooh. And as a minority creator and a creator with a smaller platform than these other commentary tubers, it's, it's weird because why am I scared? You know, why am I scared to voice against white supremacy and conflate it with creators. I think it should be a more thoughtful, nuanced practice. I'm very strict with myself on that. Like if I can't make the video that I want to make, I just don't. I would get upset. <laughs> like there are several times we're working on a video where I've just realized I can't say most of the things I want to say that it's either not going to get pushed by the algorithm or it's going to get punished or. So to me, um, I. I have to kind of police myself and water down some of my forms of thoughts. And I saw this a lot in the Wednesday video, because when I started watering down my thoughts to a more like, OK, this is what you liberals are doing instead of explicitly saying you white people. I was saying you liberals are doing yeah, you're doing okay. this, you're doing yeah. this, you're doing this one. It's at almost 150K views now, you know, so it's like. There, there's a very there's a very very okay. very rigid pattern going on here because in the black culture video when i was like mask off and i was talking about all these patronizing experiences and everything that video got it's just got demonetized and buried in the algorithm yeah even though it was like had it was one of my videos with the most comments on it with the most with the best like ratio with right. the best like everything it's just it just got buried in the algorithm because i spoke too much about I, I correlate that experience too much with white people, you know, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. It's uh, something I've had to give into to an extent when it comes to like how I make my thumbnails and title my videos because YouTube and clickbait and mm -hmm. the audience as well, I'm not letting y'all off the hook. It's y'all too, because if y'all didn't want it, <laughs> to look in a mirror. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, I'm like, audiences really like to... <laughs> That automatic, you know, there's this kind of anti, everyone talks about anti-intellectualism, but I would love to start a, I would love to start a conversation on anti-artistry because mm -hmm. I think we're so irony poisoned to the point where like when people are vulnerable and artistic and cathartic, we're like, ew, why? This is an art. No one wants to see that. People think that, again, it's like, it's like a class thing. It's like a pretension thing. People think that there is some 
way that they're supposed to interact with art. And actually, it's all much humbler and much more straightforward and unfortunately more vulnerable. If I could be any artist with total freedom, I'd be the Backstreet Boys. Tell me why. But my second choice is Sir Terry Pratchett, the guy who wrote the Discworld novels, a phenomenal writer. Of course, he's dead now. Everyone dies. Bye, Manchego. I met him once. It was nice. I can actually tell you the story since this isn't a video essay anyway. Thank fuck. It was at a convention, so it wasn't like a cool way to meet or anything, but because it was the first Irish Discworld convention and it happened in a hotel in the middle of nowhere, it was a very intimate and casual and small scale affair. Almost everyone got to rub shoulders with the great Sir Terry and I was lucky because he took one look at me, gestured and said, is there something of Rasputin happening here? That's right, Terry Pratchett insulted me to my face. But later, when he stood up and announced, many's the person who has woken up tied to a lamppost in Bristol has discovered too late that they have had one too many pints of Guinness. I do not intend to make the same mistake. So would anyone like this pint someone has just bought me? And no one was forthcoming. So, of course, I said yes, and that meant that Terry Pratchett once gave me a pint. Note my careful wording. Finally, and I'm sorry to go on, but <laughs> this isn't a video essay. I was getting my little book signed, and this is the part that has to do with art. I said, I just want to thank you for showing me that the world can be broken up into a million pieces, turned over, inspected, mucked around with, and still put back together into something real, something useful, something beautiful. And he said, well, thank you for all the money. It's kind of cringe to admit, but I was writing my little fantasy book when I met Terry Pratchett. Are you all working on your little books? Yes, good, you should be. I had the little voice in my head even then, though maybe not quite as loud, saying, you have to write, you have to create, you, you have to get it out. You know that little voice? But honestly, I do think that if I hold in my heart an aspiration to be any particular kind of artist, it is to be Terry Pratchett. I want to follow that trajectory. The Discworld series started off as pure satire of the 1980s direct and unambiguous paperback variety. It entered an oversaturated market full of lazy derivative fantasy and Discworld just kind of pointed and laughed. I mean, from the word go, there were original ideas in what would become Pratchett's distinctive style of a witty narrator, playing with your expectations, descriptions of what literally could not be imagined, and of course, practical solutions to the impractical problems of magical worlds. But there's no Discworld without a background radiation of fantasy worlds. You can't have postmodern texts without a form to disrupt, a scaffolding to unmake. Terry Pratchett did not invent dragons or trolls or wizards. He didn't even invent the idea of a flat world on the back of a giant turtle. He simply took it seriously. Many of the books in the series are simply, what if this thing from our world but on the disc world, whether that's cinema or rock and roll or Santa Claus or the postal service or trains. Does this make the disc world its own kind of derivative with extra steps? I mean, if you're feeling uncharitable, sure. I'm sure if you were feeling really uncharitable, you could just say, what's the point of books? Get to the point. The Discworld series, particularly towards the end of Pratchett's life, really starts to build upon its own world and transcend way beyond reference or satire. Pratchett starts to make powerful and unambiguous political points, humbly, humorously presented, but direct. Religious fundamentalism gets a good kicking while leaving the dignity of culture and religion itself very much intact. He talks about class warfare through ideas like the Sam Vimes Boots theory of socio-economic unfairness, which, if you're interested, goes like this. The reason that the rich were so rich, Vimes reasoned, was because they managed to spend less money. Take Boots, for example. He earned $38 a month plus allowances. A really good pair of leather boots cost $50 but an affordable pair of boots, which were sort of okay for a season or two and then leaked like hell when the cardboard gave out, cost about $10. Those were the kind of boots Vimes always bought and wore until the soles were so thin that he could tell where he was in Ankh-Morpork Pork on a foggy night by the feel of the cobbles. But the thing was that good boots lasted for years and years. A man who could afford $50 had a pair of boots that would still be keeping his feet dry in 10 years time, while a poor man who could only afford cheap boots would have spent $100 on boots in the same time and would still have wet feet. 
This was the Captain Samuel Vimes Boots theory of socioeconomic unfairness. This theory is currently being championed by anti-poverty activist Jack Monroe, who is campaigning for a Vimes Boots Index of pricing for consumers in the UK. Pratchett wrote about bigotry and people's attitudes to goblins. He wrote about defying gender expectations. In fact, a trans revolution in some ways by way of his dwarves who were all male, even the ones who aren't. When TERFs tried to claim that Pratchett would have hated all this gender ideology stuff, his legacy of being a progressive ally was defended by his daughter Rihanna and his dear friend and fellow author Neil Gaiman, both of whom basically told the TERFs and continue to tell the TERFs to go fuck themselves, but with wittier language, of course. I could go on about Pratchett forever, but I can also pretend to have some kind of a through line here, if you prefer. His work became ridiculously popular and artistically transcendent, but it could not have existed without metatextuality, parody, and postmodern reference. Early on, these books were sorted in bookshops and libraries as children's literature, or under comedy, the worst shelf in any bookshop, or as strange offshoots of fantasy. But eventually, like Stephen King across the genre aisle from him, the fantasy section of bookshops became Pratchett et al, as this Discworld thing became the fantasy world of the 1990s. Harry Potter! And this is where I am with this sort of thing now, because far from actively writing a fantasy book, I'm, I'm doing this shit, right? And I feel like I'm part of the most exciting artistic movement right now, the video essay. When I look at CJ the X or ContraPoints or Ponderful or Turb or Jacob Geller or Patrick Williams, I see so much power, zeitgeist surfing, raw honesty, pure artistic potential in this weird medium. I love it. And I also see a lot of reference to great work. That's a big part of the medium. It's an artistic movement that is by its very nature referential. And that's cool. But sometimes, frankly, well, I see a lot of celebration of innovation and imagination, as well as a lot of bemoaning complacency and being derivative, like when we talk about Zack Snyder or the MCU, which we do a lot. Who are we to say that they're derivative though? Do you know what I mean? Like we're not innovative. Not when form overtakes the crack, not when habit overtakes possibility. But this video essay shit is also a popular medium, perhaps exactly because it stands outside of art and outside of society and simply describes what is happening. Maybe that's just what we like now. Criticism, commentary, dialogue, just the art form that is someone keeping you company. Perhaps distracting from these useful, utility-centered and humble ideas would unmake the very thing that makes a video essay good. <laughs> perhaps explosions and innovation would distract from or unmake the very essence of video essay. Maybe all the cries of get to the point are happening in the comment section for good reason. Because we as a culture have exhausted the self-referential conversation of art. We're tired and put off by art referring to itself abstractly and <laughs> applauding the frankly daft and sloppy artistic decisions of modern artists and experimental filmmakers. Maybe we're actually doing something better. Perhaps the video essay is art that insists on being useful to the exclusion of artistry itself. Or maybe I'm drawing a distinction between art and usefulness for no reason. Maybe that's a habit of form. Maybe that's a silly problem with our preconceptions of art and its place as an obfuscating busyness for the idle and the upper class. Maybe I'm just too fucking Irish, standing next to a fancy car saying, Jesus, it's first sexy looking. Are you sure it works? Oscar Wilde, who was also Irish, said in the preface to the picture of Dorian Gray, the artist is the creator of beautiful things. To reveal art and conceal the artist is art's aim. The critic is he who can translate into another manner or a new material his impression of beautiful things. And he also said, We can forgive a man for making a useful thing as long as he does not admire it. The only excuse for making a useless thing is that one admires it intensely. All art is quite useless. <laughs> All art is quite useless. Hmm. Hmm. Oscar Wilde's assertion, I love the picture of Dorian Gray, but that's the worst part of it. Yeah. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't personally buy that. And maybe that's because I'm a critic, you know, but then mm. I have to contend with the idea that I'm actually a critic and not an artist, which is uh, inconceivable. If art is the act of doing, and I'm doing it every day, you mm -hmm. know, for at least an hour, but realistically, I'm doing it for more like six hours a day. And for every essay that I'm doing, I'm writing, you know, 40 pages or whatever on this topic. I'm like, is that really any different from what like every writer I know does? And the writers I know will say no, 
It's, mm. it's basically the same thing in practice. It's just a different form. So when I do this backwards and unconvincing Socratic dialogue with myself, where I'm saying video essays, you have to transcend, go to the place, go beyond reference. It's just there. Make what you make into that beauty to which you refer, like the disc world or something. Maybe that sort of artistic neuroticism on my part is actually exactly the sort of thing that Terry fucking Pratchett would have torn to shreds. He'd make fun of me, wouldn't he? I mean, it wouldn't be the first time. I was gonna say, I say this with all due respect, but I don't. All those artists that are like, well, I'm the true artiste, like often they are so full of shit. I <laughs> um, uh, actually did two giant essays on James Franco and then another one on Anthony Bourdain, right? And they're like actually interesting comparisons in my mind. The whole time I was working on them, I was thinking about it because James Franco has always asserted that he's like a true artiste. Mm -hmm. You know, he's an auteur and he's here to assert himself as the next like Stanley Kubrick of his generation. And he's so literary. Anthony Bourdain read and wrote voraciously for his entire life before randomly submitting to the New Yorker in his forties and becoming a thing, right? right? But what he did is he lived like his passion. Mm. You know, he, he, he wrote creatively and he wrote essays, you know, he did criticism. I really feel like it's, it's like a fuck you to poet laureates, you know? And you're like, yes. I was so sick of hearing about the, you know, the 1950s and the train that was a cigarette and the cigarette that was a train. And then we all went into the midnight <laughs> and the endless, you know, mid middle America and like, okay, fine. But like Anthony Bourdain is talking about fucking gyoza and I'm like transported. It, it's not actually about the gyoza. The gyoza is just the frame of reference, Yes, you know? Yeah. And even if it's like, there are some passages where he writes about food that I will never forget because they are, you know, transformative. So the idea that criticism can't be art is like, Oscar, I love you, but you were wrong about a lot of things. <laughs>
Eris, Discordia, is also the central figure in the postmodern satirical religion of Discordianism. This is a segue into a new subject, kind of related, but my logic is suspect. It's interesting to read about the origins of Discordianism. What's this hand gesture? I hated that. It is interesting to uh, read about the origins of Discordianism. It was all very silly and incredibly juvenile, but probably in quite an innovative and Dada-esque way for the early 1960s. They have all these ridiculous names and ideas like the Pentabarf and the Book of Uterus or Operation Mindfuck or Malaclips the Younger, Omnibenevolent Polyfather of Virginity in Gold. But the most interesting thing is that in spite of that, it very occasionally approaches being profound. The religion centers on the idea that concepts like order and chaos are illusions, neither of which is more objectively true than the other. Eris, the goddess of discord, is fertile and creative, whereas her sister and fellow daughter of the void, Aneris, is sterile and destructive. From chaos comes creation, but like all binaries, this too is an illusion, a joke. The binaries do not exist, so it doesn't matter if it is a religion or not, and it doesn't matter if an adherent believes that it is a religion or not, everything is true even the things that aren't true. And when asked by the greater poop, how can this be? Mal too replied, I don't know, man. I didn't do it. This to me is like the God that is an unpronounceable word or an unthinkable thought. It's a humbling antithesis to the seriousness and self-consistent logic of religions. Often religious thought fails to result in transcendent wonder precisely by providing too many half-assed answers. In providing only questions and jokes, Discordianism occasionally does a better job than that which it is satirizing. Getting back to Pluto, obviously I'm a strict follower of the teachings of the International Astronomical Union. I do as the space professors tell me. But why does it matter? And here's a less stupid question. How come sometimes people adhere strictly to definitions in order to tell the truth, and sometimes they reject those closed ontologies in order to tell the truth? Like, for example, if you were making a video essay and you make the claim that super straights or even heterosexuals can't identify their way into the LGBTQ plus community because that's not how these definitions work. They don't share the same hegemonic foes, queer theory, read about it. Or you might say that this is the strict criteria for having narcissistic personality disorder. Do not call other people narcissists because it is not true. Or even you might claim this is the scientific method. This over here? This is not the scientific method. Scientific, unscientific. Hard border, hard border good. But how come sometimes the exact opposite is the job of the science communicator or the activist or the video essayist? So this is not a strict border. This is a social construct. Race is drawn across arbitrary lines. Property is entirely socially constructed. Identity is socially constructed. Even sex characteristics can be thought of with the best scientific data as a continuum, a spectrum. And the gender we are assigned at birth is socially constructed. No hard border, hard border bad. Or like in this case, the spectrum of size and mass and shape and orbit of objects in the solar system is really fucking arbitrary. It's just a big mess of space junk. So we need hard borders in order to definitively say what a planet is. So in the context of the context of the incredibly boring question, is this a video essay or not? If we take the Discordian position, it really does not matter at all. I don't know, man, I didn't make it. But let's rule that out for now. Instead, let's cut it like this. How do we practically and pragmatically decide what's a spectrum thing with a fuzzy border and what's a categorical thing with a hard border? If we want to assert what is helpful and use that to navigate discovery, praxis and life, then how do we procedurally and pragmatically draw a distinction between blow it all up postmodernism, helpful, and construct it into useful categories, metamodernism, helpful? And how do you, as consumer of that information, know when to trust the judgment of the person who has decided between building the category or blowing up the category? And at what point do you forget it all and say there is no such thing as an unpronounceable word or an unthinkable thought? We're coming out of a period where people wanted to be like rational and detached from their inclinations. They wanted to, to formalize things reductively and outside of those human concerns. And then we come along at this generation, this time, this moment, this <laughs> the movement, age of Aquarius, <laughs> this age of Aquarius. And we're like, no, everything is artistic. Actually, everything is on a spectrum and everything is like, it depends on a sort of poetic, uh, artistic decision you make 
within that value system, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically just theater kids going up to the rationalists and be like, no, <laughs> it's all like, yes, and actually. <laughs> In The Ethics of Ambiguity, Simone de Beauvoir examines the ways we interact with freedom. And she separates these into categories. Of course, they're not capital R real categories, they're just ways of thinking of things. For example, in the domain of hard borders and hard facts, you have the serious man. De Beauvoir's conception of the serious man is one who, when faced with the freedom and therefore relativism, abstraction, absurdity, the challenges of existence, he rejects it. He makes an external cause or goal or value system the source of all that is good and true. It's something he values more than freedom. Certainty. But the serious man puts nothing into question. For the military man, the army is useful. For the colonial administrator, the highway. For the serious revolutionary, the revolution. Army, highway, revolution. Productions become inhuman idols to which one will not hesitate to sacrifice man himself. Therefore, the serious man is dangerous. It is natural that he makes himself a tyrant. Dishonestly ignoring the subjectivity of his choice, he pretends that the unconditioned value of the object is being asserted through him. And by the same token, he also ignores the values of the subjectivity and the freedom of others to such an extent that sacrificing them to the thing, he persuades himself that what he sacrifices is nothing. And yes, I'm sure you have a mental image of this person, but people are complicated. People are individual. I mean, not me. But the point is, serious man can be a thing that we all do rather than a thing that we are. So in deriving a particular truth or following a certain line of reasoning, a certain cause, we might fail to recognize our own freedom and subjectivity and, to put it in a way that the existentialists might fuck with, we might fail to recognize our ability to play. Prevailing wisdoms are provided by serious men. Indeed, de Beauvoir points out that this is the most common relationship with freedom, at least it was in 1940s Europe. But prevailing wisdoms and unexamined social constructs, unexamined biases, they emerge in pretty much every facet of life. An in-culture discursive conundrum, leftist infighting or a clash of the sciences, a prevailing hypocrisy, a shared blindness, a stubbornness, whatever it is, we can and do quite often benefit from examining whether or not we are the serious men. Are we not men? We are heroes. There is no categorical reality out there with things fitting tidily into their own boxes. We're living in a mess of interactions and schemas and frameworks all layered onto each other in ways which are obvious to us in our heads, but are so abstracted from capital R reality. All of it is named, categorized, and socially constructed by humans. Apart from the serious man, in the domain of soft borders and the abstract, the meaningless, the substanceless, the pointless, we have, of course, the nihilist. To de Beauvoir, you could say the nihilist is closer to freedom. But while they do reject the serious man's certainty, they don't find themselves free. Their perspective relies on rejecting objectivity, but they stop there. They don't replace it with anything except nothingness. To de Beauvoir, because we exist and because life is a thing, we have to engage with meaning rather than simply rejecting it. The nihilist is close to the spirit of seriousness. For instead of realizing his negativity as a living movement, he conceives his annihilation in a substantial way. He wants to be nothing. And this nothing that he dreams of is still another sort of being. Nihilism is disappointed seriousness, which has turned back upon itself. Now, am I being a bit intellectual dark web? and saying that moral relativism inevitably leads to annihilation, suicide, and civilization itself exploding. No, 
Again, think of the nihilist as a thing you can do relative to the problems that assail you in relation to the stuff that we are all trying to figure out. With this conception, I want to focus less on the despair and more on the decontextualization of relative truth. You see, because we came up with these social constructs and categories, we now interact with them in a very real way. No, I shouldn't say we came up with them because I don't want to have an allegiance to the serious men and their rules about the world. The people who invented and reified and violently imposed our current realities were the colonizers and the rapists. The rules that today serious man would unquestioningly follow are white supremacy, are sexism, are capitalism, are the oppressive forces that erase our humanity and relegate people to their category, and that category to role of object, utility. But because we have inherited these social constructs, we are forced to interact with them in a very real way. So while they may only be true, as pointed out earlier, in a given frame of reference or in our heads, they can still really fucking matter. Race is a social construct in that there is no truth to the separate categories of person with hard borders on this peninsula, on this landmass, across this religious or socioeconomic border. Like our example of planets, yes, there are rocks in space, but there are a million ways to draw the lines around the rocks or you could do none at all. And so because we in the English speaking world have largely inherited the English sense of race as a biological reality in a specific way with specific lines that we also completely change on a whim. Hello there, Italians and Irish, you're white now. Algerians, I'm afraid you're still not Jews. Well, are you Ashkenazi or Sephardim or Mizrahi? You know what, we're still making up our minds. Because in truth, there are no hard and fast genetic differences, phrenological archetypes, or hierarchies of God's fucking favorites. We made that up. But because we made it up, cops in America, who are themselves constructed to abuse power, defined, in fact, by power abuse, are preposterously disproportionate in their abuse of power if it is directed at black people. So it is useful, not so much to bring race into it, as it is to recognize that race is in it already. Socially constructed or not, we need a certain vocabulary, certain facticity, if we are going to do any emancipation. And this is where the ideas of nihilist and serious man begin to show their usefulness, because while it might seem at first glance like an arbitrary difference between hard border and soft border, and we just use each when it suits us, and de Beauvoir is just pointing at approaches to life and saying, with maybe some French superiority, whatever they're doing, they're not doing it correctly. She actually answers this beautifully. Because in an ambiguous world, with such tension between vying forces and frameworks, the attempt to free everyone is the only true freedom. If you remember and still care or think it matters at all the question of what is a video essay, it matters in as much as it affords the space to play and potentially disrupts what might be unfortunate, limiting, or hierarchical presumption of form. The emancipatory power of play matters. The freedom to express and to be individually or as a culture. It matters that we question and disrupt, not with a view to nothing, but with a view to freedom. And that means freedom for everyone. Art need not be, as Picasso put it, a lie that tells the truth, but in fact it can be a truth that exposes the lies. Activist art might be the truest, freest form of art that there can be. For me, very specifically, like it's it's a little cringe, but like doing this like 100% saved my life. Like this is why I get up in the morning. And even if I can't like define what I'm doing when somebody asks me, I still have like more purpose than than I've ever had. And it feels good even when I'm like 18 hours a day sitting in this chair with sciatica. It's officially cringe. It's like uh, socially sanctioned. Oh, 100%. Cringe. I love but it. Like, uh, yeah, exactly. It's like, but it's beautiful. Like that's, it's cringe because it's beautiful. It's like, oh, I'm afraid it's, a truly poetic thing meme. happened. I am cringe, but I am free. Yes, it's yeah. like, I, I, I totally relate to you, you saying like, this is meaning making. This is giving the meaning. Like this is a very yeah. meaningful part of, of my life too. <laughs> De Beauvoir wasn't necessarily hot on artists either, and in order to actually tell the truth, we should really account for ourselves, right? So, 
Am I free, Simone? Is Neil? Is our channel just chasing passion instead of just being, instead of doing? And should we stop and ask ourselves why? Yeah, it's it's me, Cole. It's it's me. Why don't I make a video asking if video essays are art, Cole? <laughs> Why'd you do That's that? Me, what inspired you to ask that question? Why'd you ask that question? Uh, I had a I had a breakdown in mid November uh, because I had realized that I was I was hitting my nine year mark on YouTube here soon, and I was like okay, but is that what I want? Like, I've always kind of wanted to be more of like an artist type, you know, direct some films, maybe do something more creative. And so what it really inspired me to make that video was kind of just asking like, okay, I'm doing this. This is my job. And I like doing this, but is that conducive to my goals and what I want to do in the future? And if it's not, where do I go from here? But I was diagnosed with OCD. Mm. Um, and so I realized that a lot of these like routines that I have and these things that I do, are not really me being like disciplined or whatever, even though I, I would still consider myself pretty disciplined. They're really more like fear of if I'm not writing every day, I can't call myself a writer and then I don't know what I am and then what mm. am I? And so it's more motivated by like anxiety and compulsion. Mm -hmm. And I deleted social media because I felt like the need to perform and remind people that I still existed was rooted in that exact same anxiety and compulsion. Wow. Oh, well, I will have to think about that one <laughs> as somebody who does use social media and is, is going through it. Like, I, like I, 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 I've described it as uh, Twitter at the moment is like Ireland in the 2008 financial crash. All my friends are leaving. Oh my I'm deciding at, at present we're doing well enough on the channel that I'm, I'm kind of deciding the sort of, person I'm going to be for the next foreseeable while you know it's like this is this is what I'm doing it's working and um and so the first thing I do is go like well what is a video essay anyway I don't need to you know like blow this shit up but um yeah to be honest I'm like um I guess I'm like frightened you know I'm like uh, yeah I don't know like is this is this good enough? Is this like, is this a good, are video essays good? I know I definitely like it when my art is kind of interesting and useful. And um, as, as you say, the, the things that I use are also sort of nicely shaped and stuff. Like at one point I wanted to make a video actually, which was going to be called like the politics of craft beer. Um, and was going to all be <laughs> about this kind of obsession with the idea of, of like craft and with this idea of like, artisanal kind of relationship or, or process that goes into creating things that surround us in an mm -hmm. era where in uh, kind of advanced capitalist nations sort of a lot of manual production has shifted to elsewhere in the world that we've come to sort of fetishize this idea of that process of making stuff whether it's mechanical keyboards or whether it's craft beer or whether it's like artisanal bread where did i get to that from <laughs> I, well I, I know it's really interesting i mean like it's it's coming from two people who are wearing lovely jumpers you know and it's like well lovely lovely jumpers are also an expression of this like i think uh like or video essays are the craft beer of documentary um where you know we want to have it we want to have it like nicely made we want to have it like made by someone it's like this is joe joe makes the video essays you know mm -hmm. joe works in a small shed in illinois and makes the video essays and they're all very carefully crafted and it's just for you you know <laughs> it's like it's like the art artisanal documentary isn't it ever since i hit like 40k followers on tiktok i've always deciphered turb from the uh, right right turb is who i am when i'm on screen turb is who i am when i have my hair up when when i when I, my hair is dyed when i'm talking about black liberation but the is just a dude that walks through life and is trying to survive, you know, okay. because Theob, Theob is from that disenfranchised experience. Theob is trying to trying to provide for his family, trying to do like praxis in real life, trying to still trying to figure out himself out. But Turb is this dude that it, that knows everything <laughs> that that already jumped on the camera. Sorry, not knows everything, but knows more, more than right. he's letting on way yes. more than he's letting on like turp is the dude that just hops on and says like 
all these quips and all these statements and you agree with them and you're like, oh, that was funny. Oh, that was awesomely edited. I am very, I'm a very plain person when you take away the term. It was, uh, you can cut this out if you need to, but it was, uh, I was agoraphobic. It was due to a hate crime. So I was, this was sort of like, I need to find something that gives me purpose and I haven't been able to do that for most of my adult life. So the, the feeling of directionlessness and um, not being able to like impact the world in any way, especially as like an agoraphobic person, you, your impact is like contained to like a, a, for me, like a a bachelor apartment. (laughs) There is no real impact on the world whatsoever. And then I started watching video essays and I don't even remember how they were suggested to me. Like I didn't watch YouTube. I never went on YouTube, but I was, I was so inspired. Like the second I started watching them, I was like, oh, this is like, this is exactly what I've always wanted and didn't know existed. For me, very specifically, like it's, it's a little cringe, but like, All right, so here's the thing. My mom died in her early 50s, heart attack. My maternal grandfather, her dad, died in his early 50s, heart attack. I smoked for most of my adult life. I just lapsed recently. Back on that giving up life now, please don't be disappointed in me. You know, whether it's fatalistic or not, I'm actually pretty resigned to the fact that I am going to die in my early 50s, no matter what I do. I really just think that's what's going to happen and and I can make real world provisions in case it doesn't happen in as much as any millennial can do that but I think it's just as pragmatic to be psychologically and spiritually prepared for when it does. (laughs) Did I just say whether it's fatalistic or not? It's like the definition of fatalistic isn't it? And some of you could rightfully be like oh that's really bad for your head thinking like that there's no need to think like that happy happy no such thing as death or, or here's a fucking study, you don't know what your heart's gonna do. I bet some of you who are very resistant to that kind of fatalistic thinking are American. The land of dangerous optimism, enforced positivity. I know some of you will have lost people and worry about losing others and worry sometimes about losing yourself. I'm not going to minimize that anguish and I recognize that truly, culturally, there are different levels of discomfort for you around death than there is for me. I'm Northern European. I come from one of the most dark and cynical and black humor places on the planet. And I am pretty sure I'm going to die young, young ish. And because I'm sure of that, I've made myself very busy with very peculiar things. I've wanted to make everything that is good about me external. I've wanted to forgive quickly and to be seen well and to figure out as much as I could and to come up with the most inspiring and beautiful way of thinking about things that I could and to share it. I wanted to write some catchy tunes and some memorable turns of phrase and put those in other people's brains. I've basically spent most of my adult life trying to back myself up like a hard drive. I had a really hard time engaging with this essay. I have a hard time engaging with Neil's motivation for art. I cried when they told me what they were planning on writing cried again when they read it to me. I cried into their shoulder and tried to hold on to them as tightly as possible, but I could feel their excited energy pulsing under my arms, as if they could will their body to be still for a few moments to endure my hug, but they couldn't hide how alight and energized their being was under the surface of their skin. I don't want to die, ever. I think I want to do it all again. I want to see what would have happened if I'd made different decisions. Not to make up for my mistakes, I'm too far gone with just how catastrophic catastrophe can get to care all that much about not making mistakes. I'm just curious, greedy, and filled with a kind of longing for the homes and the adventures that might have been. I'm going to go back there someday, could actually be about death, you know. Well, I don't think so. I do not make art because I'm afraid to die. I do not make art to capture anything of myself. Neil has such a compelling and driven reason to make art and mine is pale in comparison. 
I started making essays because I wanted an essay to exist, to show to people, and it didn't exist yet. I wanted to explain to my parents what polyamory was. I wanted to cut through cultural baggage around love and monogamy, and the essay didn't exist, so Neil and I decided to make it. And we decided first to practice with other essays that we saw didn't exist, and that's sort of what keeps happening. I read a feminist book from the 1970s and think, oh my god, why is no one talking about this? And I pitch it to Neil, and they practically vibrate in their seat with ideas, and we pass the ideas back and forth over a bottle of wine, and then suddenly, essay. So now I just make them. One of the things I love about Neil and I's relationship was always how we could sit for hours dissecting something, and now it feels like we just put those conversations into the world. I, I do wonder what life would have been like without this idea in my head that I have to make art. Maybe I'd be better at being, at stopping and smelling the flowers, but I feel like that's a problem most people have, and the existentialists are real fucking mean and critical about it. I think if I had one more spin around, I could have made at least one relationship work out that didn't. And I could have treated people better, handled money better. When we talk about oppression or disenfranchisement or discrimination, I think we have such low standards for the treatment of people that we forget just how hard it is to live even one privileged life. So the limitations for like black young fellas in Atlanta or whatever are like questions of basic safety, true life or death shit, never being treated kindly by society. And when you think about how precarious opportunities are in the general population and how heartbreaking it is to not fulfill your dreams or to not know how good you would have been at something or how heartbreaking it is to have a family or a relationship torn apart by circumstances. How easy it is to make one fucking mistake and no one gives you the opportunity to make lots of little ones. That to me is a really relevant part of the conversation about disadvantage, the theft of beauty. I have fought against Neil saying so matter-of-factly that they'll die in their 50s. I made them go to the doctor to get a full physical when they pitched the idea for this essay. I made them go back on the medication they had been on to stop smoking because they had a small relapse. I ordered STI kits in the post. I don't know if it even makes sense that we'd need them, but here, prick your finger, measure this thing. Are you sure the doctor ran every test? Should we be eating more nuts? Should we be getting more sleep? I would have loved to have been non-binary from the start. But oh, fuck me, I am not welcome in this world as any kind of lipstick-wearing willy-haver. Just not happening. Not yet. And I think even I thought that some of the Twitter people were being a bit hyperbolic when they made reference to the trans debate being the crux of a fascist uprising. And here we are, not that many years later, the UK genuinely maintaining and ratcheting further and further right consolidation of power, and it doesn't matter how unpopular they get. Being opposed to gender ideology, a fucking term coined by the Pope who was in the Hitler Youth, being opposed to that is a very popular position. None of us like fascism or the Holocaust or the Second World War or the Tories, but we can all agree that the combination of lipstick and a willy is more dangerous. I want to retake this whole section. Neil sometimes tells me that I'm gonzo. It started when we were lost in a dodgy part of a city and I wanted to get out and photograph things. And now, whenever we're in a situation which is less than ideal, and I'm saying this is so cool, Neil tells me I'm being gonzo. It does, in some ways, mirror this stumbled upon mantra I have for myself. If my life won't be happy, I'll at least make it interesting. That's guided a lot of my choices. A lot of moving to countries where I don't speak the language, or changing job fields, or taking various other bizarre leaps of faith. Now I actually think that rolling back on women's reproductive rights, the wage stagnation, and the class war, the Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, the anti-LGBTQ stuff broadly, and also the fucking racial injustice and outright hatred of black people in the States and here in Ireland and in the UK and online, even tearing at the structures of the leftist content creator sphere. You can't move but for this all-encompassing hatred and bigotry. It's more than just a fascist uprising. And it's more than a series of easily pointed to antagonists. It is indescribable. 
And then there's climate catastrophe, and in that context, the question of what is real praxis? Now explain to me why you would bother making a video essay. <laughs> Almost like, now my fear of death isn't driving me to make the world a better place, it's actually holding me back. That's how I feel now sometimes, sealing myself off and trying to get better and better at art. Trying to say a bigger and bigger, more honest and vulnerable truth, because if I really wanted to do something, then I could just do something really fucking radical and unignorable and violent, self-destructive publicly. You know what I'm talking about, right? Don't you? Martyrdom? You think about it too sometimes, don't you? At which point I'm like, is that just death again, knocking? Hi, Neely, not so bad when you get to know me. Neil talked about finding and losing homes, the vaguely familiar feeling of home. My first sense of home uh, was with David. A childhood with parents who I fought with a lot, compounded by me having undiagnosed ADHD and being categorized as smart but lazy and arrogant when in hindsight it was more so unable to focus on things that didn't really captivate me, and having that misinterpreted incorrectly by people around me until I chose to lean into being a fuck-up. That had changed in college. I moved out, and university meant I was able to sign up for the subjects that I was already fascinated with, and with having only one or two papers per class a semester to do with strict deadlines, it meant I was able to focus and get things done, and get things in, and get good grades, and excel academically for the first time in my life. And I met David. And we fell in love. And we moved in together. And we went to concerts, and we went on holidays, and we took loads of drugs, and then we tried sobriety, and I graduated, and I got a job, and we moved into my dream apartment, and we traveled more, and we lit fires in our fireplace, and hung art on the walls, and we started talking about the practicalities of having a baby within the next year or two, and every night we spent hours and hours talking about life, and the universe, and the nature of existence, and anthropology, and psychology, and space. David, and my cat Marmalade, and me. My life was figured out. I felt secure with my place in reality, and I felt like I was home. David Harvey died from cystic fibrosis three weeks after his 23rd birthday. He was indescribably vibrant, kind, enthusiastic. And he was so much more than that collection of words, and more than a collection of anecdotes either. Uh, one time, for example, I noticed a spider trying to climb out of our bathtub. He started to walk up the walls, slipped back to the bottom, started again. And I didn't think that much of it. I figured he'd find his way out. But hours later, I came back and I found the same spider doing the same thing. And so David scooped up the spider and took it to a safe alcove in the wall outside and watched it collapse. And so he fretted over it. And every few hours he went to check on it. He was putting eyedroppers worth of water nearby in case it was thirsty and monitoring whether it had moved. I think he caught up in the middle of the night to check on it. The second day, he found a dead fly, and he brought it to the spider, who lunged at it. It was terrifying and heartening. And the next day, the spider was gone. Presumably, David had saved it. This story is very stale, to be honest. It's one I've told before. I don't really feel him in it when I tell it. It's my desperate attempt to capture this completely random moment of kindness in a whole lifetime of billions of moments. I don't know that it would even be notable, except that he died that same year, and it popped into my mind in reaching for a way to tell someone about him once, and the story resonated with whoever that was, and now it's just one I tell. But there's very little of him in there in my mind. It's very flat compared to the extraordinary bigness of who he was. He had a beautiful voice. 
He had been an actor and a singer in musical theater productions his whole childhood before I met him. When I knew him, he was pretty detached from that, but he still had the voice. A handful of times in my life when I was really upset, when the cat seemed like she was going to die or something similar, he'd hold me close and just gently whisper sing this Hebrew song in my ear. I don't speak Hebrew, so I don't know what the song meant, but his voice would be so clear and so melodious and so comforting. When David died, I didn't go home for weeks. I lived in the downstairs of David's stepmom Melanie's house. I didn't eat much. I looked at photos of David. I drank beer people had brought us when we were sitting shiva. I wrote. I went to grief therapy. I became terrified over the idea that the memories were the only bits I had left and overwhelmed with fear that I'd lose them. My grief therapist gave me a cardboard box and beautiful sheets of paper and I used colorful pens to write words and phrases and memories related to David onto them so I could cut them up and put them in the box, write them down whenever one popped into my head to try and preserve them. I counted the pictures I've had of him. I wrote frantic, disordered emails to people asking if they had more photos. I listened to the few voicemails that I had saved on my phone over and over and over. I had dreams where we were under the covers in bed holding each other and both weeping because I didn't want him to be dead and he didn't want to be dead either. And eventually I went back to our apartment and I threw away the food he had bought for himself that was now molding in the fridge. And I went through his clothes and separated those that I wanted to keep from those that I could send to his younger brother. I visited my aunt Pat and got drunk with her and wept about how much I missed David and how much she missed my Uncle Joe. I carried a Sharpie with me and wrote David's name on all the random places I could think of, on bridges and rocks and the bathroom stalls at Burning Man. I cried in coffee shops and at music festivals and on public transportation and sitting on benches. I slept with a velvet bag of his ashes next to me on the bed. And finally, I packed our home into boxes and put them in a storage unit and moved to Japan, a place that David had really wanted to go. My motivation for living was tied up in the fact that he could not, and I owed it to him to keep going. If my life couldn't be happy, I'd at least make sure it was interesting. Because David had CF, a disease which had a life expectancy of 37, people assumed that I must have known he would die. But I didn't. I would look at the medications in the research pipeline and think, when that's approved, everything will change. I would read papers on new treatments and think, they're making so much progress. I looked up his doctor's publication record when we picked her and reassured myself that in addition to being extremely kind and personable and a good listener, she was also incredibly prestigious as a doctor. I fought with insurance companies on the phone until Obamacare passed and it meant that we had to jump through fewer hoops to keep David insured. I had a million backup plans. I was sure we had connections at the best hospital in the country for lung transplants. I made sure David took all of his meds and did all of his treatments. And we went on hikes and we went skiing and it felt like, yeah, okay, this illness is supposed to kill you, but it's not gonna kill him. Not with how much I love him. Someone as special as him couldn't actually die. He will be dead 12 years this March. This essay is being made right around the anniversary of the domino effects that led to his death. A difficult winter, catching the flu, 
growing antibiotic resistance, a blood infection caught in the hospital. It was the perfect storm. Something that happens with CF and something I did not plan for. He died in my arms with his father and stepmother holding his hands and with my mother holding his foot. My dad having just left to walk the dog after sleeping on the floor of the hospital waiting room all night. I sang in his ear until the nurse turned off the machine monitoring him and his father and I both threw ourselves onto the furniture and howled. I have the cardboard box full of those scraps of paper. I've moved it with me to the 15 different homes spread over six different countries that I have lived in since he died. It has come with me while I was backpacking and otherwise it sat in drawers next to different beds. I don't open it often. When I do, I read the little papers and I might smile or I might cry. And I do remember these fleeting bits of him, but it's not really him. Neil talks about death, about trying to capture parts of themselves and put it into the world and capture the extraordinary experience of their brain and to change people's lives and make the world better and to create and capture and do. But if Neil were to die tomorrow and if I were left bereaved again, widowed again, <laughs> having another unfathomably beautiful love of my life disappear in a way that I cannot comprehend, I don't know that I would watch these essays. Not because Neil isn't being themselves in them, they are. The essays do an incredible job of conveying the silly, earnest, gentle parts of my Neil, but they're nothing compared to the totality of Neil. What it feels like to hold them while they're sleeping. The way their brain jumps between ideas, the way they laugh. Sometimes they, they open their mouth as wide as it can go in a smile and they shake their full body with joy. The way they smell, the way they kiss, the delicate, soft shape of their hands. Donald Trump visited Ireland a few years ago and by sheer coincidence, I was driving around West Clare and six shiny armored cars with tinted windows started to approach the same roundabout I was approaching from the opposite side. I swear to God, I've had a weird life. So this thought flashed across my mind to just ram into one of these armored cars, like a, like a real devil on your shoulder kind of thought. Be like John Hinckley shooting Reagan. It's pointless and people will think you're mentally ill, but you can just do it anyway, even if it's not the right car. My kids were in the back. I didn't do shit. I said, girls, look, it's Donald Trump. And they went, ew, because that was their political understanding at the time. And I was left with an unshakable feeling that I was on a spectrum of cowardice, circumstance, and apathy. And I should remember both to be coldly, nakedly aware of that, and to remember that everyone else is also on that spectrum. And my hope is that now I have a way of resolving all the many paths that my relationship with death might lead me down. I hope I've figured out a way to approach this. Video essays are not praxis, not hard praxis anyway, but I'm doing them anyway. My raison d'etre now is that while other people will do a better job of telling the left to arm themselves or defend themselves, get organized, get scary, get ready, I'm going to defer to the data and my own instincts and make sure that if they should get their hands on a gun, the first person any given leftist shoots isn't themselves. I really mean that. Access to guns is incredibly dangerous for the owner with their own brain, particularly when we're talking about a cohort with way above chance of depression and suicidal ideation, and we're talking about them in a time of duress. So my business, my job, my fucking waste of time while I've got the time, is to say things along the lines of, oh, there is such beauty, and you are such beauty, and you have so much work to do, and trust me, I've been there with the whole death thing. Often it passes, and there's no harm in a bit of healthy anger, and a bit of healthy despair, bit of fire for your belly. It's not necessarily comfortable, but you'd better be getting shit done. You can get help, you can ask for help, you can get community, it's out there. You just do not have the luxury of one, not trying to make everyone free, and therefore, and two, not taking care of yourself. Because unless we make our art and 
that's our art as lives, our lives as art, into something collective and of utility and aggressively designed to change the world and make it better, then we run the risk, I'm afraid, of just making crap video essays. And you can tell me that that's all we're doing. You can say it in the comments below. I don't give a flying fuck. But I hope you can at least see from this that we don't want to just make video essays. The idea is to prevent suicides, to prevent genocides. I actually want to save the world. Do you want to save the world? Can we admit that to each other? Do you want to save the world? I want to save the world. Do, do you? Neil almost died a few years ago. They had undiagnosed ulcers and were working a manual labour job through increasingly severe stomach pain. They got home and took a nap and downplayed it, even though they felt faint and were seeing blood in the toilet. They spent about half of their weeks at my place and I was moving later in the month to be nearer to them, but we hadn't fully moved in together yet and they lived in a really isolated location and I wasn't with them and their car had just been taken to the shop. The more we texted, the more anxious I got. At one point, I could tell that they were a bit annoyed with me. I worry a lot. But then the messages from them got slightly more serious. They called an ambulance. It took hours to arrive. We texted. They began hemorrhaging blood from different parts of their body. And then the text stopped. I heard that the ambulance had finally arrived, and I still didn't know how bad it was. Neil's youngest, my now stepdaughter, started messaging me on Snapchat, something like, it was scary when dad fell, but I'm okay now. I messaged her back, being as tearful as I could, while trying to get more information about what she meant. Neil had, in fact, fully lost consciousness from blood loss, collapsed on the ground in front of her. So I sent her photos of my cats and she sent me photos of her making silly faces and her mom picked her up and took her back to her other home. And I waited for Neil to text me. They did the next morning, August 10th, 2020, 6.06 a.m. Hi, made it to morning. Be okay. But also, I'm not the only person here. It's not about me. And no matter how big or brave or honest I try to be, I won't be able to convey anything without being more than a little solipsistic. When we say that abstract and esoteric, the only true freedom is when everyone is free, what does that mean? Where is it coming from? There's a deceptively simple insight for me behind it. When you dissolve your own subjectivity, and disrupt seeing others as object, you can understand the nature of freedom and then you can understand your freedom and therefore their freedom. So again, in practical terms, I can turn to someone else to tell me I'm wrong, to make truth truer, to make truth true by making it external to each of us, right? And I'm lucky, I'm loved, I'm listened to. I collaborate on existence with an equal, I hope. And we foster one another's freedom, but also, yeah, she tells me I'm wrong, because of course I am. And it's worse than that. I am in the strange position now of feeling like I'm home again. I have two cats. I have two stepdaughters. I have a bathtub and a fireplace and a back garden that I share with a very kind neighbor. I am meeting people in my town and I'm making art with someone I love. I've gotten to take my stepkids on holiday and I got to buy them good Christmas presents and I've gotten to dye my partner's hair and make them feel beautiful. My life with Neil is beautiful. And my life with David was beautiful. And I was so happy in that life. And I am so happy in this life. And I am so lucky to have connected and loved such extraordinary people. I don't know if Neil and I will always stay together. People change, people fight. I don't want us to be together if it's not something happy and healthy and beautiful. But I hope that we last 
and I know that that means that the only way I won't watch Neil die is if I go first. And I find myself occasionally slipping into the pattern of magical thinking that I used to fall into with David. Neil talks about their mother, and I look up information on heart conditions. I make Neil take vitamins every day. I nag them to get the test results from the doctor, and I fret about whether they're sleeping. My chest grows cold when they say they have a stomachache. But I know at a level that I did not when I was 23, and hooking up home IVs to my partner's pick line, I know now that people do die. That the most special it people in the world die. And that love is not enough to save them. It would make a prettier essay if I could tie this up somehow. If I could say that being gonzo and taking risks had led me to where I am, and if I could say, now oh, my life is interesting and I'm happy, and it's true. Or I could focus on the box of paper memories next to my bed that I haven't opened in I don't know how long, and make some statement about the futility of dealing with forces like death and memory and the passage of time. But we pitch this project as being not a video essay. And I told Neil that my one stipulation about writing this section was that I didn't want to consciously shape it into anything. Because I'm thinking of David and how extraordinary he was. And how there is a hole punched into the fabric of reality from how profoundly not okay it is that he's not here. And it would feel perverse to shape him into an essay and make it make sense. Because it doesn't make sense. His death doesn't make sense. So this is how I'll end it. No restatement of themes and no coherent point. I live my life with Neil not seeing death as an old friend, but refusing to look at death. It's a presence on the periphery, waiting someday to rip reality to shreds. It's the definition of pure terror. And I pet my cats and watch films with my stepkids and make essays for YouTube with my love. But I cannot make myself agree with Neil about art or death. No matter what art you make, no matter how many photos you take, it will never be enough. And it couldn't be enough. Death is the most enormous and terrifying tragedy I can imagine. I can never forgive this world for being one in which people die. Hello? It's a big wave. My phone's not going to be able to capture it. supposed to be a fun essay yeah it was it was fun <laughs> it partly was the song about pluto was fun somehow i don't think it was as free and self-indulgent as it could have been what do you mean oh, there was some kind of through line daring us to shape the essay around it and even though i'm not quite sure what the through line was i feel like it wanted to be a video essay mm. Well, two things. First, Neil, you and I are bad at making hub essays. We can't just like, make a video essay. <laughs> we have to care, and it has to be real, and it has to be honest, and by the end, one or both of us has to be crying. crying. <laughs> there were two things, sweetie. <laughs> yeah, okay, what was it? Okay, second. Um, I think the 
is this a video essay bit? That wasn't the real question. It was the lie we told ourselves that allowed us to go to the place. Like Orson Welles and the lies and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. As far as I can tell, <laughs> the only lie we told in the beginning was when you said this isn't a video essay and, and that line was useful. Why was it useful? Because look where we went with this. I think um, we all want to impact the world in the time we have. Tikkun olam to butcher Hebrew. And mm. um, you've got this idea that you don't have unlimited time and that drives you to work harder than anyone I've ever met. And it means that everything you make feels monumental. Well, you are marginally more terrified of uh, the bad information other people are putting into the world than you are of how you might fuck up. Uh, so <laughs> that kind of makes you like the most reluctant superhero I could think of. <laughs> and it makes it easier for me to sleep at night because uh, I want to do things that are important. And I know that if something is important to you, then it must be important. It means I'm talking about things that are important. I don't know where we go after this. I don't know how we end our original bit was just for me to read the entirety of the conclusion of the episode. Yeah, so ambiguity. yeah. and it would save a lot of effort because I'm a lot more confident in Simone de Beauvoir than I am in my own shaky understanding of things. Our original plan. We had a lot of original plans. <laughs> Come now, we must advance the medium. <laughs> and anyway, it's only a bloody video essay, isn't it? It's just a little guy. <laughs> We, we stop and pay attention to the little things and video essays. We talk about Mad Max Fury Road for eight hours. And share yourself with gyoza as an excuse. This is just an excuse to not have an excuse. I was um, looking through photos of David for this essay, which was hard. It was his birthday. It was just his birthday. And I came across these two photos of the sunset and it made me remember... We were in Santiago, we were taking a cab from the airport back to the States, and there was the most incredible sunset I'd ever seen, and we're just staring at it. And I was nagging David to take photos, and we were like looking at the photos compared to the subs, the sunset, and it was so uncapturable. And I have the photos now, they're not even good, they're blurred. <laughs> yeah. But I remember the sunset because of the photos. So we make this art and we're trying to change the world, but it's not quite enough. We're trying to be honest and vulnerable and it's not quite enough. But if we let not enough stop us, we wouldn't ever make anything. That's the whole gorgeous dance, isn't it? This is, it's never going to be enough. From fucking cave paintings to uh, Da Vinci to Marcel Duchamp to fucking Bill Wirtz. We have to try and get these things out the truth even if it's really just too big and it's a preposterous thing to try and get out because i'm actually i'm actually with david in in terms of not taking pictures of the sunset i think i would have had exactly the same position but i also think it's incredibly cool that you wrote his name <laughs> and then what do you want to do now Neil? <laughs> I'd like to do it all again. <laughs> People get really bent out of shape around like the part that's like, but what is art? Right? That's the bit that people can't seem to answer. Did you have a similar experience with people not being able to answer the what is art part? Yeah, that was kind of everybody's first, first, like after the initial shock of like, is it? I don't know. Um, they kind of ask, okay, well, what is art then? You know, if this is or isn't art, we have to know what art is and then that's kind of that's also a very ambiguous question because defining art is very open-ended and you can make exceptions and exemptions in wherever you want and it's really up to the individual no i would consider it depends sometimes okay. when i'm making like i did a video about nostalgia and i had like a digital art piece at the beginning of it mm. or just like a little edited thing that i made that was more about feeling and like getting people uh yeah i don't know just it it, it, anytime I do something artistic with my essays, people watch less. <laughs> so, right. Like, or YouTube maybe doesn't promote, know how to promote it, or maybe it just looks too different and people are worried. But, like, 
I think my stuff is more educational than anything. All right. Hey. Turb. Yeah. Turb. <laughs> Here we are. Hello, Lola. Hello. It's so good to actually, yeah, chat face face. Uh, it's it's wonderful. Yeah. But I hope, I, I always just kind of hope to like, I guess I do appreciate the being witness part because I think it helps other people. Yes. That it gives people permission because a lot of times we sometimes just need it from someone else. So, yeah. yeah. Because like you could be the, you could be the one example, uh, the, that, or the yeah. first example of, of uh, a shared mutual story, pain. Uh, and if I'm, if I'm going to say that I'm someone of service, then I have to be willing to honor that too. But it's interesting that when I when I was thinking about that question, that I was thinking, oh, I am sort of doing this a bit for me as well. Um, and I hope that if the topic that I'm writing about is interesting to me, that somewhere on the internet there is some other people like me who will also find it interesting. <laughs> this, this idea that you are in love with the research uh as a as a process it's not my favorite process by any means but and it depends on who you speak to but uh as to which bit of it they really they really like uh nobody likes filming um but <laughs> as far as i'm aware um but stuff yeah. can only go wrong when you're filming exactly it's just i think hard. like every other process is of like construct whereas filming you've usually unless it's something unless it's something like this but like with filming you've usually got an idea of what it's going to look like right and it can only deviate from that usually in a negative like it it can only deviate from that in a negative way like it's very it's very hard and it's actually funny that i'm like okay well actually filming sometimes filming is nice <laughs> i will admit this has been like really 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 pleasant but um yeah i really appreciate um you jumping in thank you so much okay okay love you very much you. talk to you soon love you. bye <laughs> Beep.